Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Deep Dive. This is the podcast where we talk about Michael Jackson's Invincible album, using it as a biographical background to discuss the man, his life, and his legacy. In the last episode, I tried to explain why I wrote a book about Invincible, um, because it's not a very popular album and people are divided about the, the value of this album among Michael Jackson's um, other albums. And on this episode, I just want to go a little bit into what I said about the songs on Invincible. Um, there's a lot of detail in my book. I won't be going into that, but I'll be giving you a hint of why the themes and the genres, not to mention the vocals and the engineering on this album are unique. Let me see a few excerpts here and there. So already you know if you listen to my first episode that I like to compare the Invincible album with the Off The Wall album because I think that they have a kind of common thread that runs through both of them. They're like what I call, um, what's that, twin albums? Um, what do you got? Is it twin flame? There's something about that. So yeah, so those albums are, they are twin, they are twin albums, sister albums. So let's see, I want to, I want to, I want to provide a few, um, a little bit of insight into some of the tracks in particular. That's what I want to do in this podcast. So one, I say in the book that, you know, a lot of people say that Invincible sounds all over the place. I've heard that before. And I argue in this book that it's because Michael Jackson combines all of himself in this one album. So you have a little bit of the funky ballads from Off the Wall. You have the Daredevilry from Thriller. You have the Maverick Rebel from Bad and Dangerous. And you have the Storyteller from History. All of that in one album. This complex layer is what you call the Mature Michael. I also say in my book that Invincible still sounds ahead of its time. It's amazing. That album is going to be 25 years old in a few years. And it could easily be released tomorrow morning. That's how I feel. Um, in my book, Deep Dive, I note the variety of tones and themes on Invincible. For example, I mentioned the somber but defiant tones on Invincible, the track, and Unbreakable, the track. Huh? Michael Jackson is all up in your face. He's calm, but he's serious. Like, you know what? I know who I am. There's a few flutters. So that's the transition or the contrast between being absolutely defiant and then being vulnerable. So if you go to butterflies, heaven can wait. You see the vulnerability and the flutters. Butterflies, flutters. I think that's a play on words. There is the theme of leave me alone. I will not call it paranoia. Paranoia is a derogatory expression related to Michael Jackson that certain critics whom I'll discuss later in other episodes use for Michael Jackson. What's going on in songs like Privacy on this album is Michael Jackson's reaction to the way that the media treats him. That is not paranoia. That's a real thing. That's a victim saying, this is how I feel. So privacy, and privacy is a very unique song. Later on in this, in this book, I discuss why privacy is a stand, standout song. So I talk about um, also vulnerability in Don't Walk Away. Don't Walk Away is one of the crowning songs of this album because of its vocal prowess. It's just intense. It's lush. It's like a garden. There is no other song on Invincible, where Michael Jackson flexes his vocal superpowers, like, don't walk away. Then I speak about the swooning of soul in Speechless, not to mention the choral arrangements. And I talk about the love in Break of Dawn. Break of Dawn is Michael Jackson's first time talking about sex in, in um, you know, in actual terms. Michael Jackson's other songs in his previous albums, he alluded to sex. He, you, you could feel the energy through his vocals, the drama, the bedroom voice, but he never said sex. 
But on this album, he says it right out in your face. He says, I want to make love to the break of dawn. So it's a first for Michael. But it's also a beautiful song, by the way. Yeah, so my overview of the transition of themes on the Invincible album is what I say here in the opening chapter. I say that Jackson's Invincible maintains the maverick innovation that began on Bad. See how crazy a departure of Bad was from Thriller? Michael Jackson was hell-bent on self-reinvention. And Invincible marks a sonic ascent from the pensive moods and tense fury of the two history albums. Remember how those albums felt? They were angry, they were dark. Michael Jackson is not angry on Invincible. He just laid back. And Invincible gives the first inklings of a feathery float, right back to the airy ballads of Thriller, Human Nature, TLCPYT, and the laid back groove of Off the Wall. Yeah, that's how I feel. Um, so in the second chapter of my book, I go a little bit into how I feel about some tracks. I could jump right into one that you're probably not expecting, and that's The Lost Children. There is a story arc in The Lost Children that goes right back to childhood in history. And every other time that Michael Jackson referenced his own childhood and his empathy for the sanctity, vulnerability, and promise of childhood. Let's talk about something else. Um, music, uh, movie likes scores. I compared the Invincible album now to the History album, which is a very orchestral album. I say that the, the, the movie-like themes on Invincible are less orchestral than on History, but one song retains the same sweeping symphonic arrangements, and that is Don't Walk Away. I refer to Don't Walk Away as a power ballad that swoons right up the bat. Deeply haunting melodic strings, distinctly clear filtered acoustics, and ambitious sonic values. There is a bridge part where Michael Jackson goes, and why? The prolonged resonance is just immaculate. And you can see the perfect engineering by Teddy Riley on this song. The chemistry between both of them, actually, because Teddy Riley knows Michael Jackson better than most people in terms of working together in the studio. And then the instruments on this song are just like, they just, they make me dream dreams. There's a clanging cymbals, there's oriental chimes. And like I said, the most pristine vocals on the entire album and insane vibrato, the heart tugging lyrics, the cadence of the clashing cymbals and the intermittent thump that reverberates towards the end. It's just a lot in one song. Don't Walk Away, I love that song. Um... I've already mentioned how Break of Dawn differs from everything he's ever done in terms of the sexuality of that song. But on Heartbreaker, Michael is not saying sex the way he said it in Break of Dawn. He is dramatizing sex. And that's also interesting. Now, he's done that several times in his career. But again, in this song, Heartbreaker, when you go to the bridge, there's a vocal crescendo. And the energy of that bridge is sexual. There's like a sexual tension that builds up and then splashes down into the groove of what will she say? And he drags it out like that. And then he dips into a snarl. They will say I was the man that got away. It's amazing. All of that drama is what makes Invincible something that we need to get into musically. Oh, by the way, there's a rap break on this song, the third rap break on the album. And I also mentioned in my book that this album has more raps than any other. I jump right off towards the end to Cry. Cry is a traditional gospel song, courtesy of the Andrew Crouch Choir. And they strip bare the instruments so that you can really hear the standaloneness of the performance. And I mentioned here in my book, I say, don't sleep on the altos. The altos shine on this song. I like to, when I listen to a song, I like to separate the parts, hear the harmonies and see how each part colors the song. So I say that Cry has a mellow middle falling to a crashing crescendo and a lavish show out. Now, one reason why I virtually worship this song is the percussionist. He's credited as one of the most recorded drummers in history. His work on Cry is only surpassed by the sig signature drum roll on Rock With You. Again, that's off the wall. His name is John J.R. Robinson and his cadences are spectacular. And the way he closes out this song with the drum rolls is something you should listen to. And it strengthens, again, the artistic connection between Off the Wall and Invincible. 
Michael Jackson is experimenting sonically and he grinds really hard on Heaven Can Wait. I describe Heaven Can Wait as a mid-tempo love song with a funky bass line designed to tease because every time the full-bodied baritone orchestra rises and sweeps, it drops again and it hits the floor. Did you notice that there was an orchestra on Heaven Can Wait? Go listen to it. Then I write that underneath the harmony overload that get easily lost to the air is a deliberate discordant staccato, a thump, thump, thumpity thump. It's hard to categorize this song as pure R&B because there's a lot of funk in it. So I, I write here that it's a funk song masquerading as serenade. And I say that Heaven Can Wait is this album's version of Get On The Floor. Get On The Floor is from Off The Wall. So you see in this um, review, I keep comparing both albums, the first and the last. Um, and um, yeah, I say Heaven Can Wait is less disco, but the same slapping rhythm and sultry groove. By the way, Heaven Can Wait was one of the first songs on this album to go viral in the new generation. Among Gen Z people, there was a lot of talk on TikTok and Spotify. The streams for Heaven Can Wait are probably, apart from Europe My World, the most coming from this album. So in my book, I refer to Michael Jackson as the ballad king. I was, I was speaking to a tweet that went viral recently, and I said that Invincible might be the greatest R&B album of the millennium. And let me explain why I say that. I don't just say that generally. I say that on the condition that you focus on the thematic scope of the album, the musical scope, the genres and themes that are covered, you can hardly find another R&B album after the year 2000 with this quality and that covers that scope of work. So it's worth thinking about, but I say that Michael Jackson is the ballad king. Yeah, we know he's the king of pop, but now it's time to look at him with one more, um, how you say now, accolade. Um, so I say that invincible standout power is that it's, and the way that it distinguishes itself is the sheer plethora of its swooning ballads. And I say it's arguably Michael Jackson's ballad epoch. And I say he hasn't been this vulnerable on one album since Off the Wall. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. And I say that this album returns Jackson's focus back from serious storytelling to sweet music. Actually, now that I think about it, he does both. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I said about the song Butterflies. Butterflies doesn't need me to introduce Butterflies. Butterflies is a song that when you hear it, you know. So I'm not going to say anything about it, but there's something in this book about that song. Uh, I will say that I've compared it to human nature. Um, now... There is a whole segment in my book about the songs Privacy and 2000 Watts. Michael Jackson's rock genius. It's been talked about. I'm not going to go into it now. Um, I don't know, but I refer to 2000 Watts as big dick energy. Um, I want to explain that. But I say in this book that 2000 Watts is, is the chest muscles of the album. And um, if I was releasing this album my promotional single will have been 2,000 watts for certain reasons. But I again, I make a connection between 2,000 watts and Off the Wall. Why do I say that? When Michael Jackson was introducing us to Off the Wall, he started with a song called Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. And there's a sentence at the opening of that song that says, the force, it makes me feel like. And then Michael Jackson explodes. And I feel like when he exploded on that opening of Don't Stop Till You Get Enough, he sent out a force which he was talking about into the universe. And that force has been traveling since 1979. And only 20 years later, we see that force coming right back, fully expressed as 2000 watts. It's amazing. Um, I won't go into what else I said about that, but you might want to read the book and check it out. Um, I close my book by saying that I look forward to a future reissue of Invincible. I'm not the first person to say that. The producer himself, um, Rodney Jerkins, Dark Child, did say that the album deserves re-release, I completely agree. And we have all the material for that. And even better, we have technology now that we didn't have when the album was made, which would really amplify a re-release. And I should say, I should remind you in case you forgot, that in 2026 is the diamond anniversary of this album. I think it's about time that we started working towards that important date. Oh, um, yeah, that's about it. Look, I have, I have really deep plans for the future of Invincible. It's not in my hands. I'm just a fan who is reviewing the album. But I have, I should say, I have deep plans for Invincible. Um, there's something about whatever happens, but I won't talk about it now because I think I can talk about it in another episode where I'm exposing 
what those deep plans are. And that's about it for this review, um, for this episode of um, Deep Dive. I have taken you into my opinions about some of the tracks on the album. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to ask you to do one thing for all of us. Go listen. And try not to form opinions about the album until you've listened. And you listen without the filter of what the press is saying or what the public is saying. Listen for yourself as a music lover. And see if you don't fall in love all over again with Invincible. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you again in the next episode of Deep Dive.